Pseudomonas is a poster child for gram-negative resistance and hospital-acquired infections. If you often encounter infections caused by this bacterium in daily practice, such as hospital-acquired pneumonia, urinary tract infections or even bloodstream infections, in this video I will share a few key points clinicians often miss when it comes to this particular pathogen and I'm confident this will make your decision-making a whole lot easier. Pseudomonas is intrinsically resistant to most antibiotics. Meaning, even the so-called wild-type pseudomonas that hasn't been exposed to antibiotics or healthcare in general is already resistant to most penicillins, cephalosporins and many other drug classes. I won't go into the details of its resistance mechanisms, but suffice to say that its outer membrane is impenetrable for most antibiotics and even if they get through, they will probably be promptly pumped out before they have a chance to exert their effect. That's why you will never see certain antibiotics in a Pseudomonas susceptibility report. You will never see septriaxone or ampicin or azithromycin because what would be the point in testing if we already know that Pseudomonas is always resistant to these antibiotics, right? Which leads me to the second point. The antibiotics that at least have some chance of working against Pseudomonas are called anti-pseudomonal. So, this pathogen is so significant in human medicine that we even classify antibiotics according to their ability to affect pseudomonas. But notice how I said a chance of working. That means that there are no guarantees with this bug. Since this bacterium is so adept at acquiring new resistance mechanisms on top of its intrinsic ones, it's hard to predict what it will be susceptible to, especially in hospitals. Anyway, your susceptibility report for pseudomonas will list only these anti-pseudomonal drugs, so the ones that at least have a shot at working. Notice that fluoroquinolones like ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin are the only oral anti-pseudomonal drugs for now. Every other anti-pseudomonal drug is administered intravenously or rarely intramuscularly. The good thing about anti-pseudomonal drugs is that they are usually active against a wide array of other gram-negative bacteria as well, which makes sense, doesn't it? If an antibiotic can kill one of the most resistant gram-negative rods, Pseudomonas, it's reasonable to assume that it will work against many other less resistant gram-negatives too. Now, here is a key point when looking at susceptibility reports. You may notice that instead of an S for susceptible, right? Next to most antibiotics, you will often see the letter I. We all know that S stands for susceptible and R is for resistant. But what is with the I? Normally, this would mean intermediate, which is better than R and worse than S, right? However, in the case of Pseudomonas, I simply means increased exposure. It serves to warn you that you should use a higher dose of a given antibiotic if you are targeting Pseudomonas. In other words, I doesn't mean intermediate, inferior, or borderline. It's just as good as an S, you just need to use the correct dose. That's it. This is now the agreed standard for expressing susceptibility of Pseudomonas. Once again, an I is as good as an S. Okay, now that we know what antibiotics come into play and how to read susceptibility reports, how do we choose the best antibiotic to treat our patient's infection? Well, if we already have an isolate and we know what it's susceptible to, it's pretty straightforward. We choose an antibiotic, make sure that we use the correct dose, and that's pretty much it. But still, there are a few nuances to keep in mind. Number one, if possible, avoid using carbapenems. Meropenem and imipenem are antipsodomonal, yes, but if you can use a narrower spectrum beta-lactam like piperacillin tazobactam, ceftazidim or cefepine, go with that. Or maybe you can use a fluoroquinolone like, again, levofloxacin or ciprofloxacin depending on susceptibility. The idea is to avoid carbapenems whenever possible, to preserve them for situations where we have no other option and, of course, to curb resistance. Number two, aminoglycosides like amikacin might seem like a good choice in vitro, on paper, but their pharmacokinetics really aren't great. They do achieve very high concentrations in the urinary tract, but not in the lungs, the bloodstream, abscesses, or the central nervous system. So, as monotherapy, they are basically only good for uncomplicated UTIs without sepsis, without bacteremia, and that's it. 
For all other infections, if you can, you should choose a different class of antibiotics like beta-lactams or fluoroquinolones. Okay, so much about pseudomonas with known susceptibility, but what about the other scenario? When you do suspect pseudomonas, but you don't have a microbiological confirmation yet, you don't know what this possible pseudomonas is susceptible to. How do you choose the optimum antibiotic? Well, if your patient is seriously ill, meaning septic, it's prudent to start empiric therapy with two antibiotics from different classes that are most likely to work. So, based on previous isolates and their usual susceptibility, choose two drugs that are most likely to cover the suspected pseudomonas. Usually this will be a beta-lactam like piperacillin and tazobactam, plus an aminoglycoside like amikacin or rarely a fluoroquinolone. So, you start with two drugs, but once you hopefully isolate the pathogen and determine exactly what it's susceptible to, you will de-escalate to a single drug. There is no reason to continue with two drugs. Forget synergy, faster killing of bacteria and all that. The only reason to use combination therapy for presumed pseudomonas infections is to increase the likelihood of coverage. And that's it. Once you know what works exactly, de-escalate to a single drug. I know that the names of all these antibiotics may seem overwhelming and confusing right now. You probably expect to forget them in a couple of days. But that's only because you don't see the logic behind them. Once you do, everything changes. You will need a little more time than 10 minutes and you will need a structured approach, but it's worth it. If you use antibiotics in clinical practice and you want to finally make sense of them, take a look at the first three crucial lessons from my course on antibiotics. I promise you, already after an hour, you will understand antibiotics better than you thought possible. And that's just the beginning. You would be amazed what is possible with just a few days of well-structured lessons. But I leave that up to you. The link is right there in the description. Take care.